Good evening and welcome, whether you are online or here in person at the Frank Van Horn in Jesus College. My name is Julian Huppert. I'm the director of the Intellectual Forum here at Jesus. We are a very old institution. We were originally set up in the 12th century as a nunnery. In 1496, the nuns were kicked out. We became an all-male college, but we've corrected that and continue to move in a more and more modern way. And we're still learning how to make this work with these blended events online and offline. The aim of the Intellectual Forum is to get people to think and talk about interesting and worthwhile things. And we've looked at lots of subjects, but one thing which keeps coming up over the years has been to do with technology, technology companies, our attitudes to this. So we've had speakers such as Siva Vaidyanathan, who's talked about how Facebook is fundamentally problematic and evil. We're going to be hearing next term from Twitter's head of global public policy, about why Twitter is perhaps rather less evil. And indeed, he will, of course, be presenting the case why Twitter do very good things. But this thread about technology and about power and about what we do about it has been an important thing we've come back to time and time again. But we haven't actually had one of our own former students talking to us about it, which is why it's so good to have Sam Gilbert here tonight. So Sam has a very long and distinguished history, as well as being an alum of this college. Uh, so Sam has, has had senior roles at Santander, at Experian. He was, I think, the first employee at Bought by Many, an experience he will, I'm sure, talk about, um, and wrote this fantastic book, Good Data, and why we should be more positive about our digital future. I read this very rapidly on a proof copy. I was very fortunate to have a chance to look at it, and I thought it had some really, really interesting ideas, some really interesting concepts, and quite a lot that was actually missing from the discourse that we see in the press and in so many other places about what's happening with technology and technology companies. So Sam, I'm really delighted that you could be here with us today. I'm really, really looking forward to hearing from you. Over to you. Well, thank you, Julian, for that very kind introduction. And thank you to all of you for coming out on a, a Friday evening. That's a um, very admirable commitment. Um, it's a very nice thing for me to be back in the Franka Pan Hall at Jesus College again and back at an intellectual forum event. When I was a student here, uh, I really enjoyed coming to these events. I particularly enjoyed the fact that the intellectual forum brings together people who come from different academic backgrounds. It brings together people who are from the university and people who are from outside the university. This kind of um, interdisciplinary approach is one that I value a lot. So it's a real pleasure to be with you. So my talk this evening is called reasons to be cheerful about our digital future and as Julian mentioned it's based on a book that I wrote which is called Good Data an optimist's guide to our digital future and this book itself is actually in many ways based in um, Jesus College in that it started with academic research that I did when I was a graduate student here a few years ago and at that time, I think what I was particularly interested in was what some of the um, limitations were about the theory of surveillance capitalism um, that Shoshana Zuboff has done so much to um, popularize. And based on my experiences of working in digital marketing for a long time, I felt like there were some sort of factual claims that were being made about how technology worked that weren't quite right. So that was, that was where I started from, and I, I ended up writing a thesis about the nature of power in the digital age. But as I thought about developing that thesis into a book, uh, another idea became even more important for me. And that was the idea that in this backlash that we've had against technology companies in recent years, we've, we've started to lose something. And that is a connection to all of the positive ways in which data and digital technology does and can make life better for us. So this is really the spirit in which good data was written in the spirit of trying to rediscover some of those good things that sometimes go missing a little bit. So this evening, what I would like to try and do is uh, persuade you uh, to feel cheerful about a couple of propositions that probably sound a little bit surprising if you are interested in these issues and have read about them in recent years. Um, so the first one of those propositions is that targeted advertising is actually a good business model for the internet. 
And the second of the propositions is that rather than trying to protect or focus only on protecting our data, it would actually be better for society and for all of us if we were to put more data rather than less data into the public domain. So, um, targeted advertising, why, why is this? Why might this be a good business model for the internet? Well, since the, particularly since the Cambridge Analytica scandal, we've had a lot of concern expressed about the idea of micro-targeting of advertising through digital platforms like Facebook. And I think the underpinning assumption of that criticism is that the capabilities that technology companies have got, their algorithms are so sophisticated that they can now understand us all better than we understand ourselves. And with that, obviously comes a threat both to human freedom and to democratic systems, because if companies are able to understand us in that way, they're able to manipulate us. So I think, I think that's the concern about micro-targeting. And I want to explain a little bit why I think that's wrong. So um, contrary to this belief that this is a, a new technology, micro-targeting is actually based on a technique called geodemographics, which was invented in the 1980s. And uh, geodemographics is the reason why you've got this rather retro image on the screen at the moment. So um, for younger members of the audience who might not remember what it was like to shop before we had the internet, back in the 80s and 90s, we used to have to look at catalogues like this one if we wanted to browse products we might be interested in. And one of the main drawbacks this had if you were a retailer was that catalogues are quite expensive things to print and to distribute. So if you were going to do catalog retail, you needed to be able to make good decisions about which people to send your catalogues to. And so um, what happened in response to that was the development of this technique called geodemographics, which involved combining data from the electoral roll with data from large scale consumer services in order that it was possible to say uh, for every postcode in the United Kingdom, every zip code in other countries, what things people who lived in that postcode were likely to be interested in buying. So, so I, I guess one way of expressing this would be the old saying, birds of a feather flock together. If you live in the postcode MK56FY, you probably have similar consumer preferences to your, your neighbours on that street in Milton Keynes. So the kind of the value of um, geodemographics was that if, if you, for example, were uh, wanted a, a retailer and you wanted to sell um, car seats to children, geodemographics gave you a way of addressing people who lived in suburban locations um, uh, that were a distance from public transport. And it meant you could target your uh, promotions for child car seats or your catalogue that sold those types of products to people in those areas and not worry so much about the postcodes that were in city centre locations, which might be places where students or young professionals who didn't have children would live. So I guess the thing that I'd like you to take away from this is that when targeted advertising happens on social media, it's using the techniques of geodemographics. Um, it is not a, a sort of system that is predicated on a database of information about all of us that uh, has information about our psychological weaknesses or vulnerabilities. It's really just a system for making educated guesses about what consumer preferences we all have. So it's essentially not, not as creepy as it probably seems. So you might be thinking, well, that, that, that's all very well, but why should I be targeted at all, uh, even if the techniques are from the 1980s? And I think the, the first answer to that question is that it is generally better for the economy and hence for society when businesses are able to allocate their capital in a more efficient way. So I spent a long time working in marketing. Marketing are very, uh, marketers are very um, keen on what's called Wanamaker's dilemma, which is what's written on the screen there. So the, the statement, um, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted 
The trouble is, I don't know which half. Um, some of the value of this, these technologies, these techniques, is that they enable businesses to understand better um, who to target and they enable and how they can measure the effectiveness of their ads. And thus they become more, more efficient and more productive in what they're trying to do. Um, and there's then a kind of benefit for us in our lives as consumers. So the development of digital targeting means that all kinds of businesses have become viable and scalable in a way that they wouldn't have been before if the only way that it was possible to promote products was via channels like television or via press advertising. So, it, so targeted advertising has helped move us away from a world that was dominated by players who had massive economies of scale, and it's moved us towards a world of what um, the writer Chris Anderson called the long tail, which is a world in which we are able as individuals to find out about all kinds of products and services and causes that we never could have known about if there weren't cost-effective ways to address us specifically. So I'll just try and bring that to life with, with three small examples here. So th these are actually all examples of businesses that would not be viable if it wasn't possible to target people in this way um, using uh, Facebook ads in this particular case. So the first one there is a business called Sarah's Pet Portraits. If you have a horse or if you have a different kind of pet, um, Sarah will make you a painting or a drawing of your pet. Um, the second business here on the bottom right, this is a, a business that has become one of the major uh, fancy dress apparel retailers called Morph Suits. Um, Morph Suits has been able to become so successful by targeting men who look like they're about to go on a stag do on Facebook. Uh, and then the top right, um, I was talking recently to one of my friends who's like very motivated as I guess we all should be by trying to reduce his plastic consumption. And so he'd been Googling ways to do this. And this product then presented itself to him in his Facebook feed, some plastic free sponges from a company called EcoVibe. So this was a, a kind of direct answer to a need that he had that he would not otherwise have known about. Um, yeah, so, so, so this, this, I guess, is the positive case for targeted ads being something that are economically useful, not just for people trying to grow businesses, but also for us in our, in our uh, lives as consumers. So I guess when we think about advertising, it's also helpful to think about what kind of a world we would live in if we didn't have targeted ads. So the most, or the most obvious alternative to targeted ads would be to still have advertising, but for it to be completely untargeted. So I, I guess my opinion about this is that if we had only untargeted advertising, our everyday experience of the internet would be rather degraded. So this example comes from my own Facebook feed. It's a Facebook ad for the uh, chili beef loaded fries box, which was available at selected BP petrol stations. Now I don't eat meat and I don't have a car. So this is not a particularly appealing prospect for me. And just as a small side note, if you ever want to know why you have been targeted with an ad on Facebook, you can click the gadget in the top right and ask Facebook, why am I seeing this? Um, and in this specific example, the reason I saw that ad at the time was that I was aged over 18 and I had recently been near Cambridge. So that, that's a kind of example of the opposite of micro-targeting. That's a very broad form of targeting. And what tends to happen when people use broad targeting is they focus on the lowest common denominator. So I guess what I would argue is that in a world without targeted ads, we would have an internet that was full of adverts for hookup apps and for online gambling websites and for high interest loans. And if that were the case, we might not enjoy our everyday experience of the internet so much. Um, but there's also this other sort of really surprising feature of targeted advertising that you can get to if you think about a different proposal that's been put forward. Uh, and that is the proposal that advertising business models are 
uh, so problematic that they should be banned completely and that when we use services like social media or search we should just pay cash for them instead and I think when you start to think through um, that idea you, you, you find some quite surprising things so on the screen here you've got a, a, an analysis of from good data of Facebook's financial results in 2018 split out by region and in the bottom at the middle, you can see that number of $24.76. That is the amount of money on average across all of its users in 2018 that Facebook earned. So sometimes people will say, well, we could just be paying Facebook $25 a year and then we could have the services and we wouldn't have any of the ads. But one of the things that leaves out is the differentials that exist between Facebook users in different regions of the world. So actually, if you're a user of Facebook in North America, um, your attention or your clicks on advertisements are worth more like $111 to Facebook every year. By contrast, if you're in Facebook rest of the world region, which includes places like uh, Latin America and Africa, your attention and clicks is only worth $7.45. This is simply as a, a, a function of advertisers being prepared to pay more to reach people who are in North America than they are prepared to pay to reach people in Africa. But because everybody who uses Facebook gets access to the same set of services, provided they've got a device and they've got internet connectivity, it actually means there's a kind of redistributive effect going on. So effectively, the attention of users in North America and Europe is paying uh, to subsidize the provision of these services to users in the Asia Pacific region, region and the rest of the world region. And the size of that effect is very large. So on the right hand side there, you can see it's around $25 billion worth of effective redistribution. So anyway, this is, this is a kind of different, a different dimension to the debate about targeted ads. So with that, I'm going to move on to uh, the, my, my second kind of contrarian proposition for you, which is why I think it's better for all of us if we put more data into the public domain. And to bring that to life a bit, I'd like to talk about a, a type of data that I'm particularly passionate about, and that is search data. So search data is the data that is created by all of us when we use Google and other search engines as part of our daily online lives. And uh, it, search data is just a, a fascinating source of insights into the collective consciousness of humanity. If you look at those predicted searches on the uh, left-hand side of the screen as you look at it, that is what will come up if you start searching on Google for I've just had. I'm not going to uh, read those things out. But you can see from that quite remarkable set of searches that people will turn to Google, not just for information or not just for shopping or other activities like that. People also turn to Google at the most significant and intense moments of their lives. And so in the words of Sophie Coley from answerthepublic.com, every day we tell Google things we might not tell our partners our friends, our family, or even our doctor. So when that information is collected together and anonymized, it is an incredibly powerful um, tool in a variety of different ways. So the first of those is in the commercial world. Uh, it's really, really powerful for businesses. So just one example, um, when I worked at Experian, we had a partnership with a data science business called Chiasm, and they uh, had a client relationship with Screwfix, who were interested in using search data to understand better the ways in which their customers actually searched for DIY products. So on the screen there, you've got some of the products that Screwfix discovered customers had a completely different way of thinking about from the way that they thought about them. So the product on the top left there, which is a light that comes on when somebody triggers an infrared sensor, that was listed on Screwfix website as an outdoor light. And yet what the search data said was that for the vast majority of people, 
when they look for a product like that, what they're looking for is a thing called a security light. So then in the, in the middle at the bottom, that yellow object, um, Screwfix had listed that on their website as a nailer. And yet literally 10 times as many people, when you look at search data, call that a nail gun. Uh, in the top right, um, these kind of spot bulbs, um, Screwfix didn't list those at all by the type of room that they were going to go in. Um, whereas I, along with many of you perhaps, if we are renovating our kitchen, we might well look for or Google something like kitchen lighting. Uh, and it turns out many more people search for lighting by room type than they do by uh, the type of lighting that it actually is. So in this, so what did Screwfix do with this insight? They changed, simply changed the way that they described their products and across the categories that they applied this analysis to, they saw a very significant increase in the sales they were able to make. So I got very excited by this, uh, by this particular project. And when I left to uh, start Bought by Many, the, the fintech startup that Julianne mentioned, I was thinking about how I could use search data to get a better insight into the insurance market. So when we started the company, we were particularly interested in unusual needs for insurance. And I thought that search data could probably tell me what the best single opportunity to uh, develop a new insurance product was. So I worked with Kaizen, I assembled an enormous database, hundreds of millions of lines of search data. And over a period of uh, several weeks, we analyzed this data. And it turned out that the best single opportunity in the insurance market was pug insurance. So this, this, was, this was quite surprising. Um, in fact, I think probably when I shared this insight with my colleagues, they thought there had been like it was a joke or it was, it was some kind of mistake. Um, but actually, when we investigated why it was people were searching specifically for insurance for pugs, things became much clearer. So at the time, pugs were in the process of becoming the most popular kind of puppy that people were looking for when they were looking for dogs. And if you had wanted to buy a responsibly bred pug puppy in uh, 2012 or 2013, that would have cost you about £5,000. And yet, if you had had pet insurance at that time, the maximum that a company, a pet insurance company would have paid out if your pug had been lost or stolen would have only been about £1,500. So that aspect of the insurance cover was more or less useless to you. Um, at the same time, we also found that many of the pet insurance companies that were dominating the market at that time excluded, specifically excluded, a lot of the breed-specific health problems that pugs are, are particularly prone to. So this is things like hip dysplasia or problems with breathing, problems with, um, with the eyelids. Um, so again, it was almost as if the uh, insurers had taken away the features that would have been most useful to pug owners. And so we ended up building this business bought by many on the basis of this type of insights. And we found that for at least another 70 breeds of dog and cat, exactly the same sort of dynamics existed. And uh, fast forward to now, uh, seven or eight years later, Bought by Many is one of the major providers of pet insurance in the UK and Sweden uh, and also in the US and became the latest um, fintech unicorn in the UK earlier this year. But I think um, much more exciting than the commercial potential of search data is its uh, potential in academic research. So th there is actually a, a, a small uh, sub-discipline of academic research called infodemiology, which specifically exists to apply search data to public health questions. And in the context of academic research, it's got some, uh, it's got a lot of things going for it, search data. So, so first of all, it's a massive data set. A lot of it is freely available. You don't have to collect it or to pay for it. 
uh, in some respects, it avoids some of the research bias issues that survey data can be prone to. And um, so it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very uh, rich resource for academic researchers and um, particularly in the fields of public health and economics. Um, researchers have used it for forecasting, so things like predicting the spread of infectious diseases or, or understanding the seasonality of health conditions. Um, but it was really during the, uh, the pandemic and the COVID crisis that um, search data has really come into its own as a source of public value. So some very interesting work was done by the computer scientist Bill Lampos and his team at University College London, where they built a predictive model for COVID cases using Google searches for COVID symptoms. And that model was um, sufficiently powerful that it could predict new COVID hotspots 17 days in advance of conventional public health surveillance measures. Um, it was also um, very effective at identifying COVID symptoms that had not been recognized through the official um, epidemiological channels. So it highlighted the loss of smell or anosmia as a COVID symptom a long time before um, the conventional public health surveillance got there. And um, similarly in the United States, um, Seth Stephen Davidovitz, who is a search data scientist, found eye pain uh, was, was also a, a COVID symptom that uh, had, had not been recognized. Uh, and so um, this is a moment at which we're starting to see um, this type of very useful, uh, socially useful insight from search data, making it out of academic research and out of the commercial world and into context where it is of genuine benefit to everybody. And perhaps even more excitingly, search data is applicable to contexts where conventional sources of data are missing or they're not reliable. So a digital marketer called Patrick Berlinkett took this insight from Bill Lampos's work about loss of smell searches being a leading indicator of COVID um, infections and applied it to Tanzania. So as, as you may remember, uh, the former president of Tanzania, John Magafuli, was one of the small number of international leaders who di completely disputed and rejected the seriousness of the COVID crisis. And he announced in May 2020 that Tanzania had uh, defeated COVID with only apparently 500 people having caught the disease. But at the same time, there were a lot of uh, anecdotal and social media reports of night burials being made by people wearing military uniforms, of hospitals overflowing. And there were three um, mysterious deaths of MPs in the capital, Dodoma. And what uh, Patrick was able to do was look at Google searches for loss of smell in Tanzania and map out the places where it appeared that COVID um, cases were happening. Uh, and so actually at the, at the point at which John Magafuli had announced that there were no new COVID cases, the loss of smell search data from Patrick's model was showing that there were thousands of new cases happening every week. And of course, the, the dark ending to this story was that John Magafuli, of course, himself uh, passed away from COVID, I, I think, later that year. And so there were some other really um, interesting, I think, and important ways in which search data and infodemiology can be used in a public health context. So one of the things that search data is really effective for is understanding gaps between what experts know about a disease or a condition and what ordinary people are actually thinking and doing. Um, so this is a screenshot from a paper by an Italian epidemiologist called Nicola Bragazzi, who's at York University in Canada. And he and his colleagues looked at Google searches for Zika during the um, Zika outbreak uh, in 2017. And what he found by looking at search data was that people were disproportionately Googling things relating to microcephaly. So this was this very distressing phenomenon where babies would be born with very small heads. Um, but actually that was a much less common 
um, symptom and indicator of Zika infection than other symptoms like conjunctivitis, for example. And actually what the public health officials really would have liked would have been if people were searching for information about things they could do to mitigate their risk of catching Zika in the first place. So you would have hoped to see people searching for mosquito nets or people searching for instructions on how to effectively drain areas of standing water where mosquitoes breed. So the data helped identify the gaps that public health communications could then address. And then coming back to COVID again, um, another aspect of this, uh, th this technique in for demiology is that once you understand what people are searching for, you can also investigate where they are going on Google to get their information. So a couple of uh, examples here. So on the, um, on the uh, left hand side of the screen, um, these are searches beginning can coronavirus. So the most popular search beginning can coronavirus at the time that I took this screenshot was can coronavirus mutate into something more deadly. And at the bottom there are the, uh, were the top three results on Google for that search term. So I think nature.com, this would be a good source for people to get information about the potential for coronavirus to mutate. Um, the conversation.com, I'm sure many of you know this website. It's a place where um, academics write, but in a way that's more accessible to general readers. But then the top result was this website, livescience.com, which is a privately owned news brand that just publishes a lot of content on scientific topics. Now, I, I don't know anything about livescience.com. I don't wish to try and impugn their motives, but it seems to me um, in our collective interests that actually when people Google things like can coronavirus mutate into something more deadly, um, they should find their way to authoritative information on the topic. And the takeaway, if you're somebody who works at um, an organization that does publish um, authoritative information is that if you understand more comprehensively the things people want to know, you can then write the answers to their questions. And as a function of being a highly authoritative source of that information, your answers will get to the top of Google. Um, so then similarly on the right hand side, um, searches beginning or searches including the words can and mucal mycosis. So mucal mycosis was this uh, it's a fungal infection that was a, a complication of COVID cases in India. And so there was a, a spike in searches for mucal mycosis um, earlier this year. And again, there's very sort of similar profile when you looked at uh, which websites people who were Googling uh, can mucal mycosis ended up at. So I think people who end up at the CDC, that, that feels to me like a good authoritative source of information about mucomycosis. Um, Wikipedia, it could go either way. Obviously some Wikipedia content is extremely high quality. Other Wikipedia content is not. And then the third result was a YouTube channel called Crux, which only had about 2000 followers. And again, I don't know anything about Crux. Um, they might be people with a good intent and integrity but it seems um, like a missed opportunity that number three spot on Google is being uh, occupied by such a, uh, such a sort of unusual provider of information. And in fact, possibly my favorite example of all about this was that when I looked at um, searches beginning can coronavirus in the UK in May last year, um, uh, and this, this was actually motivated by a kind of uh, personal habit that I got into, which was whenever I got a, a delivery, I felt like, I wasn't sure whether the cardboard was contaminated. And so I felt like I had to kind of leave the delivery in a decontamination zone under the stairs for an indeterminate period of time before I opened it. And so I was fascinated to see in the search data, loads of people searching for, can coronavirus live on cardboard? So lots and lots of searches for that. And the number one result on Google was from the radio station Heart FM. So not, not exactly, I mean, everybody loves Heart FM, right? But not exactly the ideal source of public health information. Um, so just to, to try and come back to why we should feel optimistic about these things. And the, the reason for optimism and excitement, I think, is that 
um, when, um, when governments, when the public sector becomes more aware of the existence of this data and is able to use it and produce content that answers the questions people ask, we will be in a much better um, situation when it comes to the public health information environment. So I, I just want to leave you with um, ways in which uh, you can use some of this information yourself, because this is another beautiful thing about search data is it's, it's highly accessible. So perhaps you've got a kind of research project you're interested in, um, perhaps you're just curious. Um, it's very, very easy to use tools like the one that you can see on the screen here, Google Trends. Um, you just go to trends.google.co.uk and you can put in a keyword um, for a topic that you're interested in. So just for illustration purposes, I thought I would look at a search volume for University of Cambridge versus University of Oxford over time. And I think that goes back five years. We can see that uh, during normal times, it's fairly level pegging. But then all of a sudden, there's this huge spike in University of Oxford's searches which I'm fairly sure is uh, explained by the existence of the Oxford vaccine. So that, that's a good way of um, quantifying the value to having your uh, brand associated with that type of development. Um, you can also in Google Trends see things like how searches are ge geographically distributed. So um, in the bottom corner here, um, it looks like Cambridge is much more popular in Ecuador and Taiwan, whereas Oxford is much more popular in Spain and Iran. So I, I, I can't explain this, but I think it's interesting nonetheless. Um, and then another tool that you might enjoy is a tool called answerthepublic.com. Uh, so what Answer the Public will do is for any keywords that you choose, it will go and scrape Google for all of the predicted um, Google searches. So it's a very, very easy and quick way into getting a richer understanding of every topic. So I just, uh, as an example, used Cambridge again. And to some of the most popular questions uh, people ask about Cambridge is, can Cambridge students work? I assume this refers to uh, work that's outside of their studies. Um, can Cambridge alumni use the library? Um, I have some personal experience of this. The answer is yes, but in quite a limited way if you want to access online resources. Um, and perhaps most fun of all, can Cambridge diets cause kidney stones? So I, I guess there must be something called the Cambridge diet, or perhaps it's a, a comment on, uh, on the catering. I'm not sure. Um, yes, so, 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 so this was it for the presentation. I hope that uh, even if I haven't convinced you of my contrarian hypotheses, I've at least given you some food for thought about some of these issues that we're very used to seeing through a particular lens uh, might be thought of in a different way. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. I mean, you covered a lot there and there is even more in the book, which is you know, definitely worth reading. And you know, I don't get a commission on it, uh, I'm afraid. Um, are there any questions from anybody here? I'm gonna, in a moment, dive back to see what there is on online, but let me come over here first. Sorry. Uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, that was really interesting. So uh, a lot of the stuff you're talking about in the beginning that I lived that life um, doing the Google search and Google analytics and all of that stuff. So I've been thinking about this because there's an uneasy tension, right, that we use Google now for searching and in information, but there's also it's fueled by a monetization engine. It's sort of like that's how search results happen. It's sort of that's why it's free, however we want to define this. Um, what do you think would be different if we went from, I just like this as a thought experiment, if we switched from this current model of Facebook and Google nominally free um, to a subscription model, what would be different if everyone had to pay by month or by week or per Google search result? Yes, so, so, so I guess I'd probably want to come back to some of my comments about the distributional consequences of that as a solution. So um, I think it would probably work uh, pretty well for uh, the majority of people who live in the, the UK or in Europe or in North America who could afford to pay the 
subscription fees month in and month out. Um, it might work rather less well for people in um, countries where average incomes are much lower. And I think one of the bits of analysis that I do in the, in the same chapter in the book is to look at or to compare the geographic distribution of Google and Facebook users with the geographic distribution of users of services like Netflix and Amazon Prime and Apple, uh, which do involve parting with large amounts of cash to use them. And I guess, as you would expect in the latter three cases, so Amazon, Netflix, Apple, there is a much greater skew in their user base towards uh, markets where affluent people live. So I think that, I guess another thing I, I try and do in the book is introduce a framework for thinking about some of these trade-offs. So, so I think um, to come back to your question, it would probably lead to a nicer experience. We would probably all have a nicer experience of search and social media if that was the model. It would be, there'd be less distractions. It would be less irritating. Um, obviously, many people just don't like being advertised to and they wouldn't have to be advertised to. But I think we, we just need to set against those benefits, um, some of the downsides in terms of uh, the, the, the distributional consequences uh, before, we, uh, before we dive into it. We have some questions. I'm just having a look here to see... Uh what's coming online. And for those who are watching there, please do use the Q&A feature to raise questions. Um, so one question here uh, that I quite liked from uh, Irene Hanasand. Are you a particularly extraordinarily optimistic man in other areas of your life that led you to look at this subject this way? Or was there an event or another experience that inspired you? Um, so, right, so, so actually, so, so, I, so I've got a confession to make here, right? The, the subtitle of the book, an Optimist's Guide to Our Digital Future is not my subtitle. Uh, this, this is the kind of subtitle that publishers uh, come up with uh, because they know much better than authors about how to position books for commercial success. So no, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't describe myself as a um, particularly, peculiarly optimistic person. In fact, the, the, the way in which I would describe myself as an optimist, I'm gonna borrow from my um, colleague at the Bennett Institute, Dimitri Zangelis, who I think gets it from Paul Roma. He will always say, he's, a, he's a, a climate expert, he will always say he is a conditional optimist. And the, 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 the sensible position to have if you want to uh, achieve positive change in the world is the position of conditional optimism, not, not sort of blind optimism or optimism that's in denial of the downsides, um, but a, a form of optimism that uh, is willing to engage with the world as it is and try and change it. And I suppose just, just to kind of make one other um, point about the nature of optimism, I think, um, in fact, I remember um, being in the Frankopan Hall towards the end of my time as a student in Cambridge and coming to a discussion about the future of the intellectual forum. And one of the things that really struck me about the discussion was that um, probably because everybody in the room was a, a student or an academic, um, all of the comments were forms of critique. They were all sort of negative things about what the intellectual forum was doing wrong and needed to change. And what struck me at the time was how completely different that is from the equivalent conversation that you have if you work in a, in a startup or another kind of business, where the default mode is always Yes, and that's what a brilliant idea. What else can we do? What's working really well and how can we make more of it? And so one of the things I sort of have taken from uh, the years I've spent working in commercial organizations is the value of taking an optimistic, constructive position. And I think part of the value is it's just more motivating than a, a position of um, critique. So like, I, I, I hope I don't come across as being an, an unrealistic optimism uh, optimist, but I hope that's given some more sort of context for what I mean when I talk about optimism. I, I remember that meeting and we'd even given people free pizza. Right, what more can you do? So I'm really interested in many of the aspects here. So, so one of the things I know is you talk just about English searches. So I, in the English language and I mm. wonder, and also you're talking about a lot, of, a lot about the reflection on the cultures that we live in. 
I wonder what do we learn about looking at the same sort of searches in different languages? And does it tell us different things about the different cultures and can, can that be used in positive ways? Yes, so this is this is a really important um, point. So thank you for bringing it up. I think, um, so I'll maybe just say something about uh, how language or, or, or like how, how Google deals with language and tools like Google Trends. Um, so the, on the plus side, Google makes um, uh, an, an attempt to sort of synthesize um, searches in different languages into particular topics. So, so when we looked at the University of Oxford and the University of Cambridge, um, that was a topic-based search, and that will have included searches that were not done in English, but nevertheless referred to the, uh, the tax on University of Cambridge or University of Oxford. Um, so they do try. Um, I would say that generally the uh, less Western a language becomes, the less effective um, Google's ability to do that is. And I think that is, I mean, I, I don't know this for sure. I mean, Tyler might be able to answer this. I suspect that's a, just a function of, you know, th these are machine learning systems. They're predicated on the availability of large corpuses of text. So if there's more text in English than, um, than in Swahili, for example, then the, the English version is gonna be, is gonna be better. Um, so, so that's that, that's the that's the caveat around the Anglo centricity of this data set. Of course, the opportunity is that there is um, enormous potential for this data to become even more powerful if the uh, the data sets and the models get richer. So, my um, colleague, Dr. Stephanie Deepavane, has done some very interesting work looking at. Google searches in East Africa in the context of elections. And that has started to reveal some, um, actually some gaps in uh, how Google applies its own policies when it comes to controversial things like um, searches that might be considered uh, hateful. So I, I would say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm being optimistic. So I wanna focus on the, the opportunity for the future rather than the, the downsides for the present. John Corbin online asked, you talk about getting putting more data into the public domain. Which of your own data would you want to have out there publicly and, and where would you put it? Yes, yeah, so, so, so that's, that, that's another really important question because I think it's a, um, I realise when I make statements like that, it sort of might be taken to imply that I'm suggesting that everybody leaves here tonight and posts their mother's maiden name and their bank account details and um, that that uh, just to be clear, I'm, I'm really not suggesting you do that. Please don't um, do that. I suppose what the the when I say that, what I'm really referring to is these um, big data sets that can be created either as a byproduct of us living our digital lives, because everything that we do when we use digital services uh, generates data. So search data is one example of this. Um, there are people who feel like that search data, the right thing for, for uh, that should happen to it is that it should just be deleted as soon as it's been created. Um, Google has no right to it. Nobody, no business or academic researcher has any right to analyze it. Um, I, I suppose I want to make the argument that uh, if we allow that type of, um, I guess what we could more technically call internet behavior or data to be, aggregated and de-identified and used by um, commercial organizations, but also by um, public health officials and by researchers, we end up in a better place collectively um, for that sacrifice, what, what might be deemed as a sacrifice of privacy. And then I guess the, the, the other sort of uh, maybe more challenging and controversial example I wanna give in that context is medical records data. So in the UK context, it seems like it is just too controversial, the idea that we would allow all of our medical records data to be pooled and analyzed. Um, even though I think like, like almost everybody would agree there are going to be important breakthroughs that can be made if that happens. Um, I actually live in uh, Denmark now. So, so Denmark is a context where people have much higher levels of trust in the government and much greater comfort with 
um, the government being able to collate data in that way. And, you know, the, the result of that is that more things become, um, become possible. Yeah, so, so I guess, yeah, just, just to sum up, like th this, this is an argument for um, thinking, thinking about these big data sets as a, a sort of common resource that we can all contribute to, but correspondingly, we, we, we should all benefit from. Yeah, just picking up on the uh, conditional optimism point, I wonder if, so I, I mean, thinking about surveillance capitalism, it struck me that a lot of the criticisms are quite specific to the US context. If you have publicly available health data that might be used to, you know, make inferences about people's health premiums in ways that might be unfair, um, that, you know, you might be more concerned about that given the sort of corporate context. Uh, and I think there are other examples of, um, you know, corporations that have uh, propagated misinformation about climate change or now might be being devious about implying how much they're doing to tackle climate change. Um, or even, you know, thinking about micro-targeting in a political context, it's quite hard to know what's actually been done, but there's, you know, talk about uh, information being presented to people in a way that makes them, you know, less likely to turn out and vote. I mean, I think you could make an argument that targeted ads could sort of speak to someone about, you know, the political issue they really care about and engage them in the political context. I can see an argument for that. But I'm wondering if, you know, the arguments that you make are really conditional on certain other regulatory, you know, factors and frameworks, which, you know, maybe in a country like Denmark, there are better regulatory structures that mean people can trust for their data. Yes, so, so, um, so lo lo lots of great thoughts in, um, in your comments. So, um, yes, so, so, so maybe I should just comment on sort of target. Oh, wait, no, let, let me comment first of all on um, the, the first point, which is about the sort of US centricity of a lot of this discussion. Um, I think this is a real problem. I think for, for sort of internet scholarship generally, far too much effort goes into analyzing problems or perceived problems that are particular to the United States or in some cases particular to uh, the UK or other sort of Western um, nations. And much, much less effort goes into understanding um, the role of digital technology and data analytics in other contexts. And um, so uh, Julian in his introductory remarks mentioned uh, Siva Vajanathan's talk. So it, he's, he's actually a great example of somebody who's a very passionate advocate for uh, people who care about these issues and want to research them, turning their attention to contexts outside of um, the ones that we usually think about. So I think, I think that's very important. Um, so on targeted um, political advertising. Um, so I guess, so, so personally, I, I, I think it's probably beneficial that political parties are able to target messages in the same way that commercial companies are. Um, and Actually, although I, I sort of described examples from catalog retail, um, it's a matter of public records that Experian, for example, has worked with the Labour Party for very many years. They used to help the Labour Party send targeted leaflet campaigns. Now they also help the Labour Party send um, Facebook ads. Um, and I, like, I, think that, I think there's a valuable role for that if um, political campaigners want to say to people who are commuters, this is what we're going to do with public transport infrastructure, and they want to say to um, families, this is what we're going to do about education. I think that's, I think that's fine. I think one of the things I discussed quite a lot in the later part of the book is the idea that it's not necessarily the techniques, these techniques of targeting that are problematic. It's the fact that um, Facebook particularly, but also all of the other big tech companies um, really apply very little control to who gets to use these techniques. So there, there, there are controls applied to uh, who gets to do party political broadcasts or party election broadcasts. There are practical barriers and norms and standards in conventional forms of marketing like direct mail that mean if you want to say something really out there, uh, untrue, um, you're going to get stopped from doing it because a mailing house is not going to agree to deliver your leaflet. 
um, in the context of um, targeted digital political advertising, it's much more of a free for all. And in my opinion, the, like some of the problems we get are because the controls aren't strong enough. If we had stronger controls and only political parties that are registered with the Electoral Commission and achieve a particular threshold were allowed to do it, and um, there was some sort of intermediation of the process of creating the ads rather than being able to log on right now and, uh, and publish them, I think we would be in a better place when it comes to political ads. A lot of questions still to come, if we can. So if I can encourage people to ask questions to be quite brief and, you know, the answers are wonderful, but perhaps <laughs> <laughs> to just to try and fit in. Um, I think you did uh, sort of hint on this in... Um, for, so um, my name is Anush Rivastav, I'm actually... And I often have a problem with... Um, the kind of regulatory frameworks that we have to ensure that data gets used only for beneficial purposes. Do you have any thoughts on uh, where we lack in the current regulatory regime and where you would want it to go to ensure that uh, I'm not particularly being monitored with respect to my private data wherever I go, but at the same time, uh, the larger objective is not being taken away? Um, yes, so, so, so thank you. I, I, I don't think I have um, sort of detailed regulatory proposals that would, would um, satisfy you as a lawyer. Um, I think as, as a sort of general observation, I would say uh, as a, as a non-lawyer, it feels like the majority of laws that we have relating to data um, focus on risk mitigation and they tend to treat um, individual privacy as being um, the most important good that should be promoted by data regulation. So may maybe what I would like to see is a little bit more recognition of the potential, the, like the, the, the potential benefits for society in data being used in more creative ways. But I, 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 I just don't know how to sort of express that in a kind of um, like a legal way, if you like. Can I follow up on the legal aspect of this with one of the questions that come in online from uh, Henry Rowan Robinson, who says, it's increasingly difficult for advertisers to be sure the audiences that they're being offered have been collected lawfully. How far should advertisers be expected to go to establish the lawfulness of the means that platforms, data brokers or audience creators have used to create and process the data? Crumbs. Um, so, 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 so I think again, like, like, like similar to the, the previous question, I feel like I'm, I'm getting slightly out of my lane when I start talking about the um, kind of technical definitions um, of the Data Protection Act in relation to data. I mean, so, so I mean, I, I guess maybe I, I, I want to um, just stress that like, I, I do think it's important that uh, advertisers and people who work with data, particularly data that contains personal information, do that in a responsible and respectful way. Um, I, I wouldn't want anybody to think that I don't think that um, protecting people's um, privacy is important. Um, like the, the cybersecurity dimension to all of these questions is also very important. It's sort of inherent in um, trying to use data constructively that some risks get created. So any collection of data immediately creates the risk that that data will be uh, leaked in, in some way. And so I think everybody who's involved in the ecosystem needs to be aware of those things and do their best to mitigate them. There was a hand. I'd like to know what you think about the data sharing issues. In in particular, I have two examples. One, uh, in the future cities where all public and private companies should share information like utilities so, so we can have like this uh, interconnected cities of the future. And the other one, which I came across in a paper, is the problem that the police has to prosecute criminals while using social media channels, their activities, and they're not using the dark web anymore. Okay, and the, the police 
the trouble of getting the information from the Yes, uh, so, so great, great questions again. So, I mean, in the context of smart cities, um, I, I guess going back to some of my comments about the importance of thinking of data as a as like common property, everybody contributes to it, everybody should benefit from it. The thing that I think is really important to avoid is a situation where a particular technology company uh, is able to monopolize that data. If it's if the data is a collective um, product of the city, uh, all of the people who live in the city ought to uh, ha have some sort of sense in which they own it and, and benefit from it. Um, I, I guess on, the, on the, the, the question of policing, like, I mean, th this also touches on other very controversial areas like the use of um, facial recognition and other um, sort of artificial intelligence technologies in policing. I guess my perspective on these is that um, as with slightly older technologies like um, wiretapping um, people's phones, like this, this is available to the police, but the threshold to be able to do it is quite high. And I, I feel like if, if we're talking about applying um, big data analytics techniques um, to social media data in order to enable some form of criminal investigation, um, that, that feels okay if it's at the level of, I don't know, um, uh, like a murder case or um, something like that. It feels not at all okay if it's at the level of a parking uh, like enforcing a parking fine. So managing those thresholds feels like the key thing to me. Before we finish, can I throw in a question of my own and then there'll be maybe time for one, one or two more. Because um, one thing I really love about your work, as you know, is the piece about the legitimacy of the various companies working in this space, um, which to me is a concept that we should think a lot more about. Could you just do a brief summary of, of your thoughts on legitimacy for all of these companies? <laughs> yes. And in, uh, this is perfect, Julian, because I can just like say, uh, here's, here's one I made earlier. Um, yes, so, uh, so, so th this on the screen is like a worked example of the legitimacy framework that I develop in the book. So just to say what legitimacy is, this is the concept in political theory that is used to discuss the acceptability of a company's power. And I sort of think about uh, there being uh, of legitimacy in the digital context as having um, five dimensions. Um, so um, business model transparency, governance, distribution of consequences, empowerment of users and controls on abuses. And the point of this framework really is that for any particular uh, technology company or any aspect of their business model or any policy proposal, we can just think about whether um, debits or credits get created across each of those dimensions. So it, it's meant to be a way of helping us think about the, um, the, the, the trade-offs between different actions. So in this specific example, this is a, um, applying the model just generally to Facebook. So we might say that Facebook isn't so good on governance because Mark Zuckerberg is essentially unassailable in his decision-making power. Um, as we discussed earlier, Facebook's pretty good in terms of its distributional consequences. It's also good in that it provides lots of useful tools for uh, people to use, but it's demonstrably not very good at controlling the way in which its tools are used to inflict um, forms of harm. So you can kind of add all of those. The idea is you can add all of those things up and um, get a better understanding of the trade-offs involved in, in, in thinking about these companies. I genuinely didn't know that you were going to have that, but maybe I'm just that predictable of what I want to talk about. Was there one other hand I saw here? Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for a great talk. I really want to read your book now. Um, um, I just wanted to ask, so you gave some really good examples on um, how um, it, using people's data can be used for applications in which we all benefit, like search terms, etc. But then I just wondering, I was wanting to know your thoughts on where the line is, maybe if there's like, if you have in your head a clear line of when um, using people's data becomes immoral, like obviously in the case a couple of years ago with Cambridge Analytica and coupling that to, you know, the um, democratic process and that having obvious, being obviously problematic. I was just wondering if in your mind there's sort of like a clear line and if it's sort of always a case by case basis in terms of like the application or if there's some sort of clear lines in terms of the process of generating that data that we can sort of 
think about? Yeah, so, so thank you. Great, great question again. I mean, it is like I, I'm a sort of bottom up kind of person. So I always find it easier to think about it on a case by case basis rather than trying to draw general um, principles about it. I think, I mean, the, the, the Cambridge Analytica case, it was definitely on the, the wrong side of the line. So regardless of the fact that probably what was actually achieved with that data has been very much exaggerated, the fact that it was technically possible for data to be given away um, about an individual, not because the individual themselves even did anything, but because their friend did something, that, that was some of the data that was able to be retrieved through the Facebook API at that time. That, that, that feels to me like one of the worst aspects of it, because that, that's completely beyond the question of whether people can cons meaningfully consent to the use of their data or not. These people just had no, like most people in Cambridge Analytica's database, had no idea that their data had been given away. Um, I think probably, like, I mean, th this actually puts me in mind of a, um, a, a, a conference I was at last week where AI regulation was being discussed. And one of the speakers made this very helpful point, which was that it's not always a good idea when you're thinking about AI to try and say which techniques or technologies are good and which ones are bad, which ones are acceptable and which ones are not. And um, because it just gets you into sort of some peculiar um, situations, I think it, it's probably more helpful if we think about um, the context in which it's being used. So this maybe comes back a little bit to some of those ideas about the important thing being um, asserting more control over get over who gets to um, access and use the data rather than what the data contains. If that makes sense. Thank you very much for everything you've said tonight. It's been really fascinating. We could go on, well, there are more questions online and, and here in person, but I think we might call it a day there. The, I'm sure people want to chat to you. Um, I'm afraid if you're online, you can't join us for a drink afterwards, but everyone else can. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, we have some well-demanded de well local beers across the way uh, in the bar. It literally comes from the basement. So, but Sam, thank you very, very much for joining us and for having such interesting conversations. So thank you. Thank you so much.